<laughs> All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Like we're live here on the broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so we want to welcome here our first panel focused on climate and sustainability in healthcare careers. Throughout 2020, the connections between the environment and health have been put under the microscope from the impact of climate on the spread of disease um, to the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on transportation and air pollution to the healing effects of the natural environment and processing and disposal of PPE and other medical waste during the pandemic. The healthcare sector was very logically the most resilient sector in 2020, but it is a viable and rewarding career in quote unquote normal times as well. In this session, panelists will discuss the intersection of sustainability and public health and the logics of healthcare systems and the potential for climate and sustainability minded healthcare workforce. We will begin by introducing the speakers and ask them each to share a bit about their career path, how they got to where they are now, and to give advice for today's students. Um, but before we begin, just quickly, my name is Anita Singh. I am uh, at NWF and I am moderating this panel today. So welcome everybody. We are going to get started with F.E. Harrison. FE serves as the de Deputy Director for the Division of Environmental Health, Science and Practice at the CDC. She has more than 15 years of experience directing project teams, implementing domestic and international interventions, and developing communication campaigns and partnership strategies for federal and state agencies, local ministries of health, and NGOs. In her career at the CDC, FE has been a health communication specialist, a project officer in the Haiti office, and a deputy branch chief. She has worked on a variety of projects, notably supporting Haiti's national electronic medical records system, Ebola relief in Liberia, and managing programs with the World Health Organization and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Effie's formal education includes an MBA from the University of Central Florida and a BS in Public Relations from Florida A&M University. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Effie Harrison. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this panel. Um, as Anita mentioned, I have been in public health, I've been with CDC roughly about 15 years. Um, my work spanned um, infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases, working um, um, overseas as well as domestic. And today um, I will talk to you a little bit about the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice Division, where I'm currently serving as the Deputy Director. And so I have a little bit of slides. I'm going to go really quickly because I know I don't have that much time, but I kind of wanted to give you just an, an overview quickly of our division and some of the work that our division does. Um, for, um, prior to it being a division, there were two divisions that were merged together. And the two divisions, I'm sorry, my light on my computer is, um, or in my office is sensitive. If I don't move it, like cuts in and out. So I have to move a little bit. So um, the division was brought together. Um, two divisions were brought together to have a stronger science base and um, science practice perspective um, to environmental health. And so these slides are discussing our vision statement, and it's the division, the division of Environmental Health Science and Practice is the most respected leader and credible source in environmental public health, protecting all populations from environmental health hazards, empowering health resilience, and equitable communities. And we've heard a lot about equitable, equitable communities during the current pandemic. And um, you'll see here the mission statement of the division and basically um, you'll see some of this language that you'll often hear with CDC with detect, prevent, reduce, reduct, and response. Our main focus areas um, are one, to apply innovative data. And you'll hear me talk about data a lot in this presentation. 
um, to detect environmental public health hazards, to build environmental public health um, evidence base, and develop and implement environmental public health best practices. In the division, we have, um, these are our top priorities, and you'll see asthma led, um, well water, um, public health impact on weather and related disasters, and then environmental public health preparedness. In the division, there's four branches, and these are the four branches, and um, you'll hear me talk about them a little bit more. And then um, these are kind of the services that the four branches um, basically um, work on. We have safe water, food safety, environmental health practices, um, then, um, vessel sanitation. The vessel sanitation, you'll, um, you'll probably remember during the pandemic and the cruise industry. And so our officers were the ones that went into the cruise ships, kind of helped to stop the spread and the containment of COVID on the cruise industry or on the ships and to get the um, passengers off board and off boarded in quarantine. So that was our division that handled that. Um, the asthma branch, as you hear, as you'll see here, these are some of the services that we work on. Um, most notably, recently, you'll hear um, we deal, we work very heavily out west around the, the wildfires and the effects of the wildfires in the air and air pollution. I'll skip this one um, for time. And then um, for lead, po the lead poisoning branch, you will most notably remember Flint, Michigan. And, um, we supported um, the state on their lead, um, their childhood lead poisoning um, program because of the lead that was in the water in Flint. And so we've been very busy working with them and still have a relationship with Michigan. And then we have our tracking and radiation branch and our tracking um, and radiation branch is basically around the radiation studies and environmental public health tracking. You'll see here that the um, public health tracking, what we're tracking is environmental exposures, health effects and population characteristics. And there's a large database, um, which is the health tracking system that has this public health and environmental health data across our different um, focus areas, as well as other parts of um, CDC. And then you'll see that the radiation studies and health studies are also in tracking. Um, towards the end of the slides, I wanted to highlight some possible opportunities for internships and fellowships. Um, CDC has a wealth of um, fellowships and um, internships for students that are recently graduated or recently graduate undergraduate, um, recently graduated graduate students, but as well as um, even high school stu students. So there's these links on these last couple of slides here um, that highlights some opportunities that students can apply for. Um, in the summer months, um, normally you will see applications for these various programs to be listed towards the January, February timeframe or right around now in the spring for the summer. Um, I shared these slides with the um, Anita, I believe they're on the, I believe this information is updated or uploaded on the um, conference website. And so you'll be able to look at these links and peruse this information. And if you have any questions about any of these programs, I'm happy to discuss them. And that is it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Afi, for that. And yes, um, we should be able to access those materials that you shared here. Um, all right, so next we are going to move to Shanda Damaris who is a climate nurse. So Dr. Shonda Demaris is a member engagement manager with practice green health, where she works with hospitals and health systems to reduce their environmental impact. A cardiovascular nurse with horticultural training background, Shonda leads the Nurses Climate Challenge, a national campaign to educate 50,000 health professionals about the health impacts of climate change. Shanda serves on the development team of the Nurses Drawdown, a global project to equip nurses to take climate action 
in accordance with Project Drawdown Solutions. Shenda also serves as an affiliate faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing and has published works on environmental sustainability in healthcare and the health impacts of climate change in local, state, and national journals. She earned her doctorate of nursing practice in health innovation and leadership from the University of Minnesota. And with that, I will um, pass it to you, Dr. Shanda Demers. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anita. And everybody, my web is a little laggy, so I want to make sure that you're able to hear me. Anita, is everything through clearly so far? Yes, you're coming through clearly so far. Thank you. Thumbs up. Okay. So for now, I'll keep my video on. Thank you. Well, I'm so delighted to join everyone today. I'm calling in from the Bay Area. Um, so I don't have slides to share, but what I would like to kick this off with is a little bit of a story. So as Anita shared, I hail from Minnesota. Um, I grew up in a small town in eastern Minnesota called La Crescent. I'm sure none of you are familiar with it, um, but it's a little town nestled in the bluffs of what's called the Driftless Area. So in this part of the country, um, the Driftless Area is this huge swath of land in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa where the glaciers didn't come through and kind of plow the land flat. So it's particularly beautiful, of course, but I spend a lot of time outdoors. My family, um, we, we weren't farmers, but we grew up in and amongst the farm community and we spent time foraging in the woods for morel mushrooms and ginseng and bloodroot and we trapped the swamps for beaver and muskrats um, and so i really grew up coming to understand um, nature and wildlife and the outdoors as something that was integrated with life I ended up at the University of Minnesota um, as a first-gen college student, and I studied nursing. But really what I wanted to study was, like, dirt and plants and the world. So you heard Anita mention that in conjunction with my nursing programming, I also sought out a horticultural degree. And I knew there must be some way to connect Healthcare, as I was learning about it in nursing school and the broader natural world. And for those of you who might be thinking about doing something similar, there are kind of two typical paths. If you find yourself as a health professional, some people can um, study using nature as a therapy or as a modality for sort of helping humans. So things like like herbal medicine or integrative medicine, where the human is really the end user of nature. And the other path, there are more than two, but the other path um, really involves conservation and thinking about how human health is entirely dependent upon the planet. If we don't have a healthy planet, we cannot have healthy humans. And that was not an area of study that was really being addressed in nursing school or medical school or, or even public health at the time. And it seemed like there was something to that. So when I graduated as a nurse, I ended up working um, at a hospital in Minneapolis, Minnesota on a cardiovascular unit for, for seven years. And while I was a bedside nurse, as you can imagine, if you've been in a hospital, the plastic and the energy and the waste and the plastic and the water and the medications and the plastic and the waste, I mean, it was just inundating. And I knew that as long as I was taking care of patients in a hospital, you know, in a tertiary care, very medically intensive, resource intensive, waste productive hospital, I was signed simultaneously doing damage to the planet as part of my job. And that felt inappropriate to me. It felt like I needed to do something. So I remember Googling, where can a nurse work in the environment? And 
when I tell this story, I say I, I developed a crush on healthcare without harm and green health. So those organizations are basically the, the nation's leading nonprofits that work right at this intersection of, of healthcare, which we've come to learn actually contributes over eight and a half percent entire nation's greenhouse gas emissions. That comes from healthcare. And what is one of the leading causes of human mortality on the planet? Air pollution. That kills more individuals worldwide than malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS combined. Air pollution. So in addition to, you know, trying to do no harm, which is really at the root of what healthcare should be, that's the Hippocratic Oath that um, physicians take, for instance, or from the nursing realm, Florence Nightingale requires us to um, take care of the environments in which our patients live. We're simultaneously damaging the environment with our greenhouse gas emissions, our waste production, um, et cetera. And so when I joined Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health, which I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, Basically now in my role, I'm able to connect directly with hospitals and health systems to help them decrease their impact on the environment. And so through Practice Green Health, I work with about 150 hospitals across the country. And there are, you know, many, many ways that hospitals have a negative impact on the environment. We talked about climate, we talked about waste, but what about chemical burden from cleaning materials? especially in the context of COVID. What about transportation emissions from hospital fleets, from ambulances, from employees traveling to work? What about the supply chain? We um, recently came out with a study in 2019 that identified healthcare supply chain as upwards of 70% of those greenhouse gas emissions contributed by healthcare. So the items that health systems are purchasing to take care of patients, the resources that go into producing those materials way downstream um, and way upstream have an impact on um, on the planet as well. So, um, and, and then food, I wanna mention food as well. We work with hospitals to help help them understand the the foods that they're bringing in to feed patients and staff and visitors all have an impact on the environment. For instance, we work with hospitals to serve more plant forward um, or, or less meat um, to reduce their environmental burden as based on the agricultural industry. Um, we encourage hospitals to buy more local and sustainable foods to decrease the amount of transportation that's used um, for for bringing food, you know, the average distance that a meal travels before it lands on someone's plate is 1,500 miles. So you can begin to see when we're working with health systems, which are almost always um, anchor institutions in their community, they employ tens of thousands of individuals. They see so many members of the community coming in to seek care. These are economic um, community institutions that are are very large and have an enormous impact on the direct environmental burden of the community, but also the global burden of the community. Um, and so I, you know, if you find yourself thinking about wanting to investigate a career that has something to do with the environment, you know, my, my suggestion is think about um, you know, if that's your real passion, but perhaps you have additional passions, how can you combine those? Because there's always a way. And from my perspective, you know, now that I work with health systems to reduce their environmental burden, I'm so glad that I was a nurse first because I get it. I understand what it's like to work in a hospital. I understand what it's like to be at a patient's bedside when they're suffering from, um, you know, absolutely the, the worst thing that's happening in their life. And having additional context has helped me bring the healthcare voice to the environmental field. And it's also helped me bring the environmental science and the health impacts of climate change back to healthcare. 
So there's always a disconnect. There's always a gap. And be creative and think about where you can fill that gap. Um, so again, I'm, I'm honored to join you all today. I'm excited to stay on for the question and answer portion of this. And for now, I'll hand it back to you, Anita. All right. Thank you so much, Shonda. Next up, um, we are going to hear from Sloan Reeves. Sloan is the recycling coordinator at the Medical University of South Carolina. Sloan is originally from Charleston, South Carolina, and graduated from the University of South Carolina with a major in sociology and a minor in psychology. Sloan's career path is a great example of identifying and building upon experiences and skills and transitioning within and between different career trajectories. His first job after graduating was cleaning and writing cars for agency Rent-A-Car. This led him to be a fleet dispatcher, a fleet manager to the county supervisor of transportation for the South Carolina Department of Education. After a brief stint of unemployment, Sloan landed a job in the medical supply chains with Roper Hospital before transitioning to his current job at the Medical University of South Carolina. So welcome Sloan, I will pass it to you. Thanks Anita and uh, thanks uh, Shonda and FE um, for sharing um, your current roles and, um, and what y'all are doing. Um, it really seems to be a great work going on there. Um, I am gonna just briefly talk about uh, my career so far and then get into a little bit more specifically of um, what I do here for the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, you know, when I first uh, got out of college, um, graduating in December of uh, 1990, I'm telling my age a little bit there, um, I, I was in a very traumatic car accident. Um, and uh, um, not to go into the accident, but I spent several months um, not being able to chase employment, not being able to uh, uh, to land a job, just trying to recover um, from that. Um, but when I was able to get into um, the market, I you know, was trying to find something to use, of course, um, my major and or minor in school, um, which kind of helped me uh, prepare um, for uh, building relationships and, and being around people and, and customer service. So um, I applied for a job and landed a job with Agency Rent-A-Car, um, which I was able to use um, a lot of my experience in education in school. Um, and then that led me to um, my first, what I'll call a real job um, with the state of South Carolina, um, working at a place, an institution here called the Citadel. Um, and it was still within transportation. Um, I was a dispatcher for a fleet of vehicles there. Um, kept up with um, customer service, um, kept up with all of our shop vehicles, the maintenance of them. Uh, and then while I was serving the customers, we had a state motor pool there um, and um, some individuals from a nearby institution called the College of Charleston was coming to lease some vehicles for, uh, from us. And they had a position open there that was a fleet manager job, and it was also a sister state agency. So I applied for that job and I was awarded that job and I worked there for four and a half years after two at the Citadel. Again, within transportation, um, you know, providing customer service, um, a lot of, uh, still learning a lot about the transportation and logistics of that. Um, I worked there, like I said, for four and a half years um, and I saw another position come open, and you'll you'll kind of get this theme um, for the state of South Carolina, working for the South Carolina Department of Education slash Transportation, um, and uh, I was uh, awarded that job and worked there for almost 12 years, basically at a school bus shop um, to where we worked with the school district on coordinating school bus transportation, oversaw the um, the the rules, uh, the policies, procedures, regulations regarding um, state-owned school bus transportation, um, but again was just developing relationships um, and uh, and just using my experience in transportation there. Um, that position did not end well for me, so I went through a brief um, stint of unemployment for about six or seven months. Um, and then I landed a, a, a job with a hospital here in town called Roper Hospital, Roper St. Francis. 
Um, really hadn't been in the medical supply chain before, uh, but uh, became um, the OR um, supervisor of, um, of supplies and oversaw a crew that um, did daily counts and picking. Um, Shonda might uh, know a little bit about this being a nurse, but have actually picking OR cases and supplies for the cases for the doctors on a pick list. Um, oversaw that for four and a half years. And then wanting to come back with my state or state position for retirement, um, I always kept an eye out for a sister hospital in town, being a medical university, and a position came up in recycling. Um, and I really didn't know a whole lot about recycling at the time besides what I did at my house. I knew the benefits, the environmental benefits of recycling. So I applied for that, and um, I've been here now three years um, and a half, going on four years. So currently in my position with the Medical University of South Carolina, it's kind of grown a little bit. I'm now actually um, coordinate all of our um, municipal solid waste um, contract and our recycling. I have a team um, currently of um, four uh, collector individuals that go across our campus, which um, has about 15,000 people on it. Um, we have over a hundred buildings ranging from ten story um, ten story hospitals to one story houses that have been turned into offices and Our job is to go in all of these buildings and collect uh, the recyclable materials um, that we can um, on our list of materials we collect are paper, both confidential and non confidential. Uh, we collect a stream that's called PGM, which stands for plastics, glass, and metal. Um, we collect um, e-waste, toner, and batteries, and we also have compost that we collect, which is the combination of food waste and compostable materials. Um, we have routes um, that are set up strategically uh, Monday through Friday for all of my teammates um, to go and collect all of this different um, material on their routes and take it downstream to where it needs to be after we collect it, you know, for further processing. And of course, we do this uh, for a, a couple of reasons. One is because we love the environment and we want to be um, as frugal with the environment as we can. And collecting these materials definitely keeps um, a lot of additional weight from landing up in, uh, for, excuse me, from ending up in our landfills and creating the methane gas that's crucial to our ozone layer. Um, and then a lot of the recyclable material that we collect on our campus has value to it. Um, so uh, the more weight that we can sort out um, of our um, solid waste going to the landfill that has value, then we get a monetary kickback for that, which comes back into our department that we're able to use um, for, for internal purposes and, and additional resources. Um, so that's what we currently do here. And I, I believe we are making a huge impact on this campus um, and for our environment here in Charleston. Um, so thank you very much for my time to speak and I'll be glad to answer any questions that come forward. All right. Thank you so much, Sloan, and also to Shonda and Epi for all sharing your stories today and your career paths and your journeys to get there. I know that that can be very helpful for students who are just entering the field. So right now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be switching to question and answers. We're going to have about 10 minutes for this section here. And I'm going to kick us off with the first question here that is about COVID-19, which has impacted our entire economy, and it has naturally brought a lot of attention to the life-saving and heroic efforts of the healthcare sector. How has the pandemic affected your own career in terms of both the work that you are doing and your plans for the future? And this is open to all panelists, whoever would like to take that on. I'll, so go, I'll first. go first. Okay, go ahead, Sloan. I'm sorry, Effie. Uh, we kind of yeah, jumped out there at the same time. Um, one of the things that uh, impacted, you know, me and and you know a great percentage of positions here and across, you know, our nation and abroad, is 
learning how to adjust and be flexible and take your work home. Um, working virtually and working remotely for me was a, a brand new um, concept um, that, you know, just wasn't immediately understood. Um, some of the technology, um, some of um, just not being here in person and the relationships, um, you know, that uh, the kind of feed off of that in-person concept is was just lacking. Um, so that was a, a big hurdle for, for us, a lot of us here. Um, also during COVID, I lost, I lost one half, 50% of my workforce. Um, so we had to look at the um, services that we were providing and prioritize those um, because we had to limit those due to the, um, the decreased resources that we had uh, to get them done. And what I'll say on, you know, on the flip side of that is, is now that we are back, some of us are back on campus and most of us are coming back on campus. You know, one of my main priorities right now for my team is to rebuild our resources body wise, try to get my team back up to the number it needs to be to be able to provide all of the expected services that our part that our department is expected to to provide. Okay, um, um, it has highlighted a lot, actually. Um, I think prior to COVID, people knew CDC as the people who walked around in the moon, the moon suits. And so you had some population that knew us, some who didn't know us. Now everyone knows us. And so, so that's a good thing. Um, but it also has highlighted some of the areas in our agency that we need to be a little bit more nimble in, and that would be data. Um, data isn't new to CDC, but how we interpreted data, published data was a slower process. And we now realize we have to be a lot more nimble and quicker. And releasing data is a more iter iterative process. And how we do that to inform public health and make decisions um, now is definitely been highlighted is a need in the agency and has been a big push since the pandemic as to how we release and how we can make decisions based off the data quicker. So that's definitely been an area um, that has been highlighted um, that uh, we're moving in that direction. There's also been another push in need for um, different types of um, disciplines, more so in the IT space, health informatics, um, medical technologists, all of those um, um, positions are now being recruited heavily as well. And so we've always, and when I say we, the federal government will always be behind the private sector when it comes to technology by design to some extent, but it, the, the lag was great in this pandemic and it was highlighted as it needs to be a little bit closer than where it is. Thank you, both Sloan and FV, and I'll take a stab at that as well. At first, we were very concerned at Practice Green Health that the hospitals that were working on sustainability would see that initiative move to a back burner because hospitals and health were really, you know, are really on the front lines and bearing an extreme burden with COVID-19, we imagine we would see more waste, more chemical use, lower rates of recycling, higher energy use due to air filtration, that sort of thing. And we have seen ebbs and flows. We have seen some sustainability departments um, have to lay off workers or lose some steam. However, um, this has really changed the way that a lot of us talk about the interconnection of climate change, pandemics, community resilience, population health, with one really clear example. When so many individuals across the planet shifted their behaviors, not overnight, but pretty quickly, we saw air cleanup, we saw water cleanup, Fewer people were driving, fewer people were um, flying, and these human behavior changes led to a direct impact on the environment. 
There were also studies that came out that identified communities with higher levels of air pollution tended to have more instances, and FE, you could absolutely check me on all of this with, you know, with, with data, um, but communities with higher levels of air pollution had higher morbidity and mortality for individuals who contracted COVID-19. Um, and so the message that um, came out of this for many folks working at the intersection of healthcare and climate is that pandemics are also looped into all, all of this. The UN came out with a report this past summer that identified climate change as a human mediated driver of increased instances of pandemics. And so the message that we're putting forward is humans across the planet clearly have the actual capacity to collectively make a movement, to collectively change. And we saw results from that that improved environmental health, which also improves human health. Um, so really coming home with that intersectionality and also the fact that just like John Muir says, everything is interconnected. When you try to pull one thing apart, it's linked to everything else in the universe. All right. Thank you all so much for your input on that. Um, we have a few more minutes left for questions. So I'm going to pull up the second question here. Um, which is, how did you know what to do right after undergrad? And also, do you have any tips for recent undergrads? This is also connected to another question that came in specifically for you, Effie, about how you chose your career path. So um, you could start with you if you're comfortable with that and then um, sure. go to Alice. So I did know, I, I tell people I fall into, I fell into public health. I don't have an MPH, um, I have an MBA. And so coming out of undergrad, um, I worked for Coca-Cola. And so I did sales um, in Coca-Cola. And then after that, I went back to grad school and got an MBA. I often tell our fellows and our students that um, work at CDC, sometimes you don't know. Um, and not knowing gets you closer to what you do know. Of course, you start off with what you're interested in and try that. And if you don't like that, that's OK, too, because you get to cross that off the list and you get to say, I know I don't want to do that. And then you're moving in, you're moving closer into where you want to go. So not knowing is as as good as um, knowing. So try things, try what you're interested in, try what um, kind of resonates with you and then try it. I think when you're fresh out of undergrad, you can take a lot of risk. I think. Um, it's less about the finance of how much you're making as much as the exposure and the experience that you're going to gain in the area of interest. And so I worked um, right before going into grad school. I worked for a year for a nonprofit, moved to New York. Um, the only thing they paid me was my cab fare in the morning to get to work. And I lived with friends and that was kind of my introduction into public health. It was around Alzheimer's. It was, the topic was Alzheimer's, but um, it was my introduction into health. And so I kind of slowly but surely gravitated towards that. So not knowing is OK. I would say be a risk taker, try different things. And then the other thing, which I think is really awesome, we are way more global now than we were when I graduated. To be able to work in all of the other countries and see some of their healthcare needs as it ties into how it affects the United States and how it affects the world globally is another awesome intersection that um, undergraduate students can look at. You can look at Peace Corps. Um, you can look at all of the different um, um, Teach for America. There's all these different programs that are out there that lends to that global space that you get to see things in a, in a different space outside of the United States. And so I would I would tell you to look at all of those or those are areas of interest. And of course, you can look at CDC. Right. We are coming up on time here. Uh, but if you, if Sloan or Shonda, you had a brief answer that you wanted to, I want to give you an opportunity to put that in either in the chat or to speak that um, before we do wrap up. I've added a couple things in the chat and the Q&A as well. Um, thanks, Anita. 
Thank you. Sloan, you're on mute. I was saying I was good for that question, Anita. Okay. Thank you all so much for uh, answering those um, and participating today. We really appreciate that. And for all of our attendees as well. Um, we are going to be taking a 30 minute break uh, and encourage all participants to continue conversation in the Healthcare Careers Lounge and check out the colleges, universities, and organizations in the Expo Hall. So thank you all so much again for your participation and uh, we really appreciate that here today.